Coming up on Studios America, Jim Garrity joins us to talk about his fascinating and revealing interview with Bob Costas. Janice Dean was unsurprisingly a target of the Cuomo brothers nastiness. We'll get into that. Uh, we're only a few days away from Stu Does America's own Christmas party power hour. Be sure to head to powerhoursurvivor.com. Get your victory t-shirt or hoodie, assuming you know you think you're going to make it through the whole hour. Otherwise, you'll have to send it back, or your state will have to send it back. And a swarm of tornadoes meant a disaster for a large portion of the Midwest this weekend. So can you guess what happened next? I'll give you a hint. It involves the left and their favorite climate change talking points. So let's set them straight yet again as we do the path of destruction. Uh, what a weekend. What a weekend. Uh, just terrible to watch all of the news pour in about the tornado that 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 uh, occurred uh, over the weekend. You know, it's one of those things where you've seen these stories before where really bad tornadoes hit, but usually it's a bit different. Like it feels like there's a series of them. And, uh, you know, there are, uh, there, of course, the pictures of tragedy, but it's you know, relatively uh, restrained to a very tight area. This was totally different. Let me give you a bit of the rundown here. Uh, in Kentucky, uh, the tornado, that's the main state um, that it actually touched down with. Although there were tornadoes that touched down in eight different states. Uh, Kentucky really got the worst of it, unfortunately. 74 are confirmed dead. 109 are unaccounted for. The, the tornado traveled 227 miles, which is completely mind-blowing to me. I mean, uh, it seems like the, the sort of thing that would be the subject of like a bad, um, you know, Sharknado type movie. Uh, but no, uh, it was a real tornado. 227 miles broke the record of the previous uh, tornado uh, 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 record holder, which was 1925. So you're going back to 1925 for that. That that was 219 miles and killed 695 people. Thankfully, I don't think we're going to hit those numbers, but it's, the numbers are really, are really, really bad. Tornadoes um, uh, have been, you know, something that we've dealt with for a long time here, of course, in the United States. We've never seen anything like this. And, and of course, we know what that means, right? Um, let me show you some of the, uh, the devastation that we see across Kentucky. Uh, really just entire areas flattened. And as is the case with tornadoes, you see the areas around them sometimes, they're, they're not even touched. It's so bizarre. But the, the, how wide and long this path was is incredibly notable. Uh, really just, it looks as if a bomb was just dropped on some of these places. And it is uh, something where you're not only going to see a loss of life, but incredible economic damages. I mean, there's a bus on its side. Uh, people, there were terrible stories at Amazon facilities, and uh, there's a candle factory that really got hit hard with this. And, you know, of course, first of all, you know, we here uh, at The Blaze, at Studios America, and on the right, I think generally, do believe that thoughts and prayers are of value. Uh, why do we think that? And I mean, honestly, thoughts... I don't really care all that much about thoughts, but I do care about prayers. Um, and it is something that is valuable and meaningful to those who happen to be of faith. In fact, it's kind of the most meaningful thing you can do. Now, I can give you another thing. Maybe you're not a person of faith. You don't care about the prayers. Let me ask you to uh, help out Mercury One. MercuryOne.org uh, is the place to go. You can help uh, help the people who were hit with this tragedy. Uh, just go to MercuryOne.org. They're always helping people uh, who are, you know, hit by tragedies like this, and this is a great time. If you were thinking about giving maybe before the end of the year, maybe for a holiday gift, this is a great place for it to go. Uh, I know there's been a lot we've come to for you this year, particularly the Afghanistan situation, and a lot of people gave uh, all they could up to the point where they could not give any more, and they gave till it hurt. Uh, so you might not be able to help out here, but if you are able, uh, this is a great place to go, mercuryone.org. Uh, and while we can sit back and we can look at what happened here in Kentucky with all of all of this over the past weekend and the surrounding states as well, all the economic damages, all the loss of life, we can look at that and we can feel 
uh, something you know, really powerful. We can feel as if we need to help do something. And we can also feel a tendency that I think all human beings have is to try to get this particular news event, uh, this tragedy, to line up with our priors. What are our prior beliefs and how does this further them? This is something that I think we've come to in a, in a really unhealthy way. Uh, over the past, I don't know, it seems to be worse at least over the past 10 or 15 years. As we've gone through this sort of social media explosion, people now look to find ways to talk about things they've already believed and have them furthered by whatever the news of the day is. This is a classic example of this, and the media, are do media is doing it in, in wide uh, numbers already, trying to take this particular tragedy and kind of shove it into the existing pathways and conversation about global warming. You know this is going to happen every single time. But uh, it was really disturbing. We could focus on the media. I can give you 100 examples of the media doing this. But let me give you the example instead here of the uh, uh, Kentucky uh, FEMA uh, situation. This, is, uh, this shouldn't be happening from someone at the level of a FEMA director talking about this with really seemingly no, no real idea of what the science actually says. Watch. This is going to be our new normal, and uh, the, the effects that we're seeing from climate change are the crisis of our generation. Uh, we're taking a lot of efforts at FEMA to work with communities to help reduce the impacts um, that we're seeing from these severe weather events and help to develop system-wide projects um, that can help protect communities. And so we'll continue to work on helping to reduce the impacts, um, but we're also prepared to respond to any community that gets impacted by one of these severe events. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that there is n no scientist who believes that things are going to be bad from global warming. Some do. Um, and some of them, um, uh, you know, get their words twisted by the media and, and it looks into constant catastrophe all the time. And that's a totally different situation here. Um, that genre of climate change stuff is something we talk about often where Maybe the, the science says we could have a problem here. Maybe there could be something going on in the future, but it's not going to be as catastrophic as they talk about. And that's something that we've talked about with you know, many authors over the years, uh, Matt Ridley, Bjorn Lomborg, uh, Michael Schellenberger, to just name a few, where, look, there might be something to some of this stuff, but it doesn't rise to the level of all out panic. Let's, you know, let's all build bunkers and, and hope we can stay underground long enough to survive the global warming catastrophe. That is sort of a different genre, though, as to what's happening here. Here we have something that's actually at odds with the science. Tornadoes in particular are almost in their, a group of their own where there is very little to no evidence that climate change makes them worse. Um, we could go through and I could give you, in fact, we should go through some of this information here today. But like it's, a, it's, an, it's an important thing to understand that how egregious this is. This is not just, OK, there's disagreeing viewpoints here and we don't know where this is going to go. This is multiple U.N. IPCC reports have said there's no tie here and they have no evidence of a tie. Let me give you some of the quotes. Roger Pilkey uh, Jr. has gone through a lot of this stuff over the years, and I'm going to show you some of his results and, and give you some more as well. But uh, here he is. This is from an IPCC report. These are quotes. Trends in tornadoes associated with severe convective storms are not robustly detected. Attribution of certain classes of extreme weather, like tornadoes, is beyond current modeling and theoretical capabilities. How tornadoes will change is an open question. How about this one? From 2000 to 2020, a period of 20 years, the U.S. experienced four EF5 tornadoes. However, from 1954 to 1974, also 20 years, they experienced 36 of these tornadoes, high-powered tornadoes hitting the country at a, at a, a level about seven times as often as we saw here at the beginning of this century. Uh, evidence suggests not increasing but decreasing tornado incidents. Uh, our work uh, it shows a long-term decline in normalized tornado losses. In fact, the decline is so pronounced, it is evidence in non-normalized data as well. So let me show you some of this data. How much damage is being done by tornadoes? And are we seeing an increase in that damage? This is, this is what's important, right? And here's the trend. This is a long-term trend going back all the way to 1950. And as you see here, a long-term multi-decade slight decrease in the incidence 
of uh, tornado damage normalized in the United States. And that is a, a kind of a mass. I mean, how many of your friends know this? How many people who watch the media understand this? That we're actually having less damage from from uh, tornadoes right now than we have been in the past. Now, of course, uh, you know, this weekend storms not factored into this analysis yet, but this is a multi-decade trend. And it doesn't show like there is there are charts you can look at going back 100 years and see the incidence of climate related deaths globally. And what you'll see in that chart is a decrease uh, when it comes to uh, per capita of about 99 percent. It's a little bit over 99 percent, actually. I mean, it is a complete drop off the planet back in the day. Tons of people died because of climate-related catastrophes, and now very few do in comparison. And the reason for that is, of course, we've adapted. We, you know, society is stronger. It's better. We're better at, at dealing with these situations. Um, and so you see that type of decrease. With tornadoes, you don't see that type of decrease. It's not down 99%, but it is a long-term gradual decline in just damages. And you might say, well, maybe that's because we're just handling these storms better. But no, not really. When you look at the violent tornadoes in the United States, this again goes back to 1950, what you see once again is a long-term, multi-decade decline in incidents. This is not... This is not... Uh, a matter of big time disagreement even among clients, climate scientists. What we've seen over and over and over and over again when they look at this data is they find that it's the amount of tornadoes that are occurring right now are fewer than we saw 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. Why is that? Well, I mean, I don't know that we're, we're, we're going to make the argument, hey, let's put as much CO2 into the atmosphere as possible, and then maybe one day we'll have no tornadoes. I don't think that's what necessarily is going on here, and I'm not, certainly not what I'm advocating. But I am advocating that this horror show, this idea that we should be blaming the climate every time we see a tornado, is not just misleading, it's completely wrong. It's, it's a total and complete sham. The data does not support it in any way. Let me give you this. This is if you don't if you think maybe Roger Pilkey, I mean, he's not, you know, some big conservative activist, but at times he is uh, he's looked at some of these issues more skeptically than the mainstream media. If you don't believe me, and you want an example from the mainstream media. Let me give you this one. Now, this is from uh, ABC News, a podcast of theirs that went over some of the uh, the tornado um, uh, coverage today. And while they point out that if temperatures warm, we might see tornadoes in different places than we saw them before, or maybe at different times than we saw them earlier. It's possible that could occur. Let me give you exactly how much evidence they have to tie climate change to tornadoes. Listen. Of all the weather genres, severe weather and tornadoes, that's the one genre that we are very much uncertain hmm. as to the link to climate change. Uh, there's no study that has shows evidence that uh, it makes tornadoes worse or stronger or more frequent. <laughs> Let me give you that again. There's no study that shows evidence that shows evidence, not like lots of evidence or really convincing evidence. There's no showing study that shows evidence that it makes tornadoes worse or stronger or more frequent. This is not the story they're telling you that it is. And yet they will still go to bat every single time. It's this idea that every single crisis has to benefit us politically in some way. And it's just wrong. It's the wrong way to do things. It's, you're doing life wrong if that's the road you're going down. This is the same thing we see every single time there is a catastrophe like this. Whenever there is a, a shooting, it's about guns. Whenever there is a hurricane, it's about climate change. Uh, these, these narratives come back and, and back and forth and back and forth over and over and over again. And it really doesn't help anybody doesn't help anybody understand the issue. It doesn't help us solve anything. It doesn't help us move our country forward in any way. It does nothing positive for anyone. So it's important that you know, when you saw the data, you saw the charts, that there's no evidence linking tornadoes to climate change. That's just not something they have in the science. That's not there. And anybody who tells you that it is there is making it up. You know, they're saying, well, we think if it gets warmer, these will happen in different places. They might happen more frequently. They might happen uh, with more power. But really, they don't have any evidence to bring that up. It's speculation at this point. Um, and that's, you know, that's not positive. Um, the problem here, though, more than all of this, is that when it comes to stuff like tornadoes, and hurricanes are kind of in the same boat here, the truth just doesn't move the needle. 
You know, the truth does not move the needle. The truth doesn't make people feel anything. The truth doesn't make people panic. The truth doesn't drive donations. The truth is boring. The truth is that, you know, climate change could present some issues. We've covered it at length, especially over longer periods of time. But those issues would be far outweighed by our ability to adapt to them. And all of the IPCC data shows this. I mean, we've gone through all of this so many times. It gets to a point where it's like, are we at a, are we at a point in our society where, it, where the amount of evidence that you have is completely irrelevant? Where people aren't going to, they've made up their mind and they're going to say what they say and no matter what the outcome of the data is, or data are, uh, the, people are not going to pay attention. People are just not going to change their mind no matter what. I feel like we've hit that wall on many things COVID. We've certainly hit that wall on many things global warming. And this is the thing. Not every single news story is specifically designed to fulfill your political priors. That's not how this works. Sometimes a tragedy is just a real tragedy. Sometimes you, the tragedy should not be used to drive votes and donations. So do, yes, do send your thoughts and prayers, at least your prayers. Your thoughts, I don't really care if you're thinking. I mean, clearly, obviously, uh, our society has given up on thinking long ago. But your prayers are important. So do send your prayers. Do donate to Mercury One. That's a really good place to go, mercuryone.org. But don't exploit the tragedy, despite how the inner workings of your soul say, I must exploit this, I must use this to make a political point. Resist that urge. Don't exploit the tragedy. Don't make this one of your examples of never let a crisis go to waste. Don't do it. And above all, don't lie. Stop telling people things that you know are not true. Just be honest with them. Give them the information. You know what? And I hate to tell you this. Maybe they won't act the way you want. Maybe they won't, they won't react, and maybe they won't donate to your organization, and maybe they won't wear the mask that you want them to wear outdoors, uh, you know, 74 feet apart from somebody else. Maybe that won't happen. Maybe your, uh, your utter desire of being able to form society in your vision won't occur. But you know what? You'll be able to live with yourself. And if you're not having those thoughts of, if I keep coming out here and I keep telling these, these lies over and over and over again, how can I live with myself? If you're not having that sort of conversation in your head, maybe you should at this point. Be honest with people. Let them make decisions. Let them manage the risk in their own lives and let them understand what the information says. And let them follow it to their own conclusion. If you're a journalist, you don't need to change the world. You just need to tell people the truth. This holiday season, you can grab a protein bar and you can have it. And it could probably taste like bark or cardboard or something like that. Or you can grab one that tastes like a candy bar, maybe even better than a candy bar. Built Bars are here for you. They've got real chocolate on the outside. They've got protein and like fiber on the inside, whatever you're, I don't know. I mean, you know me, look at, do I look like somebody who eats healthy? I'm talking about real healthy food or to, uh, that can get you through a snack, maybe a meal replacement. Uh, and you're talking low in sugars and uh, low in calories and low in net carbs and low in fat, all the things that you want to try to keep yourself a little bit healthier. You got the ugly sweater, you should try to fit in it. You know what I mean? You got uh, raspberry, mint brownie, cherry, double chocolate, cookies and cream, peanut butter brownie. The choices are endless. They've got the marshmallow puff things, which you're gonna love. Built Bars are healthy and delicious. Go to built.com to get them. Built.com, use the promo code STU15, get 15% off your first order. 15% uh, off is a great deal, and you know, you can save that money and you can buy some Christmas presents with it or another ugly sweater because that one's a little too tight. Uh, Stu15 is the code to use at built.com, 15% off, built.com, promo code Stu15. Always love having Jim Garrity on the program. He's a senior political correspondent for National Review and co-host of the excellent podcast, Three Martini Lunch, which you, of course, should go and subscribe to right at this moment. Jim, thanks for coming on the program. I appreciate it. Stu, it's good to be with you this evening. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I really am fascinated by this interview you did. I want to start here, if we could, um, mm -hmm. because 
Yeah, you know, as doing this job, as I know, is the same with, with you. You have to, you, in, you intake a lot of content, a lot of reading, a lot of interviews. Very rarely do I listen to one that co- really kind of completely changes my perspective on something. And your interview with Bob Costas kind of did that. Um, before we get into what happened here, can we go back to the backstory of this, of how you found yourself in the place talking to Bob Costas? Yes. And Stu, I should point out, there's a long version of this story. I'll try to give you and your viewers the short version. Um, The very short version is basically I ignored emails from Bob Costas for the better part of two and a half years, (laughs) Uh, which, you know, you hear about the reporters who are far too gullible and far too credulous about that, which they hear and stuff. You almost never hear about the reporters who are far too skeptical. (laughs) And when Bob Costas actually reaches out and says, hey, I heard you saying some stuff about me on your podcast. I'd like to talk. I'd like to chat. To, you know, I think you misconstrued how I feel about some things. I just assumed this was somebody impersonating Bob Costas, trying to pull my leg, pulling a prank on me. Yeah, sure. Bob Costas listens to our little, you know, rinky dink uh, right of center podcast. Turns out it really was. And uh, so I, you know, given him very terse, yeah, sure, pal, kind of responses for the better part of two and a half. He wasn't emailing me every day. This was, you know, whenever we would mention him on the podcast. Uh, it would catch his eye and he would say, hey, Jim, I think you're, you know, and the messages got more and more intense over time until the last the one I was like, boy, whoever this is, they're really sticking to this bit. <laughs> uh, man. OK. All right. It's time to give up the joke, pal. It was funny at first. And then the last one, it was like, here I am. I'm trying to have a dialogue. I'm trying to reach out and you're barely even responding to me. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go see who this guy is. But I should point out, this was not an at HBO Sports email. This was not an at NBC Sports. Right. Uh, it was a you know series of letters and uh, at a particular non you know, generic email address. Sure. Um, the skepticism so no, is somewhat warranted here. Yeah. yeah. This is the real. This is the real Bob Costas. So I, he did put his number in one of the messages, and I go and I check, and I, when I'd seen it, I was like, okay, it's not a New York uh, area code or anything like that. Mm. But then I looked and saw it's a St. Louis area code where Bob Costas has a lot of deep roots. And all of a sudden I had that creeping sense of, oh, wait a minute, maybe I've been blowing him off for the better part of two and a half years. This is going to be a really awkward conversation. Thankfully, Bob Costas is a very nice guy. He understood and had a good laugh about the fact that I had assumed I was being pranked by some Bob Costas impersonator for a while. Mm. Um, We had a chat about it. Greg and I had talked about him on the program just a few days earlier. Uh, he had been on Jake Tapper's program on CNN and been very critical of the International Olympic Committee. Now, a lot of us don't like the International Olympic Committee, but if you're, you know, viewers and listeners have watched the Olympics in the last 20 to 30 years, Bob Costas was the face of that, anchoring it from all around the world. Um, so when Bob Costas says, yeah, the IOC has really put the rest of the world in this enormously awkward situation in which you either send your athletes to the games and broadcast it and treat it like it's normal, and you run the risk of being something comparable to the uh, Olympic Games in Berlin in 1936 in Nazi Germany, uh, or you boycott, and then you end up punishing your own athletes, and lots of people are upset with you, and you know, lots of people who had nothing to do with this decision end up losing out on the opportunity of a lifetime. And uh, we had a wide-ranging conversation. He, he agreed to be on our podcast, and I should point out, Greg and I, uh, uh, usually it's 20 minutes of he and I just ranting about this the news of the day. Uh, this podcast was born based on what could we do that we could do quickly and that mm. would not involve a great deal of time or effort? Uh, thankfully, over the 11 years, it has grown and spread. But we, when we had this interaction, I was like, OK, we really should have Bob Costas on the program and we should really give him as much time as necessary to lay out how he thinks about these things. Because Greg and I had kind of made fun of him in the past. I characterized it as um, his old appearances at half times at NBC where he'd say, you know, folks, the Cowboys are using a lot of the shotgun offense today. But first... <laughs> I'd like to talk a bit about the need for common sense gun control. Now, <laughs> Bob Costas never actually said those words. It's an exaggeration, but every, uh, in my mind, he was periodically uttering uh, little political comments in, in you know regular sports broadcasts. Costas says he's only been really twice in the course of like 100 games over the years. And so if that was the case, and I created the impression that he was doing it all the time, that I feel bad about that, and everyone should judge him by the totality of his career, which I think is one of the all-time great, you know, sports broadcasters in U.S. history. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It was, it's a fascinating backstory. Um, first of all, it, it almost would be more fascinating if someone was trying to catfish you as a fake Bob Costas. That yes. would that would have been Who a great that? ending. It, it sounded stupider once I said it out loud. Yeah, once no. I did that, it's like, OK, this is, this is not going to make me look like the. The, the wise, credu- you know, incredulous, ah, you can't fool me, you know, tough-minded. Yeah, I, I would have reacted, I think, the exact same way, though. I just would have thought, oh, yeah, sure, this is really Bob Costas. So what I thought was interesting is he, you point out two of the, two of the main monologues and, uh, that he did during the football games. And I remember both of them. I remember mm-hmm. him. one was about the, the Washington Redskins team name, and one was about gun control. At least that's how I remembered it. And I, 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 he went through and explained this, and maybe we can kind of touch on his explanations here. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things I thought right off the bat was his, 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 uh, his argument was essentially, I'm not this super far left guy that you, Jim, and I, I know me and, and Glenn Beck and many others have said that he was off of, off of those monologues. Um, and just the fact that he would try to argue that he's not a far left person kind of had me believing it because you see, you know, the AOCs of the world do not try to argue that they're not really far left. That's just not a thing that goes on anymore. Um, can you kind of walk us through what he thought uh, as far as these, how he was uh, misinterpreted on these big monologues? Sure, sure. I, he described himself as a what would once be considered the center left. Uh, he didn't say he was not left of center, but mm-hmm. that he didn't, he rejected any idea that he was an extremist or far left or anything like that. Uh, he compared himself to Bill Maher, uh, mm. who I think for a lot of years, folks like you and I uh, had no use for him <laughs> and did not. Find, and now as he finds himself increasingly at odds with the woke left or the social justice warriors, the uh, the far left, that, you know, that all of a sudden we're like, oh, hey, Bill Maher, you know, all of a sudden he's not sounding so nutty to us, or at least the things that are bugging him are the same things that bug us. And uh, Costas, you know, resolutely rejected a notion that he was a supporter of wokeism. And he really gave the impression as somebody who was um, probably on the left side of the spectrum his, his his whole life and his whole career, but someone who felt like the left fringe had gone off in crazy and unacceptable directions and directions he didn't support. Um, yeah, so the first one he mentioned, and it was worth noting, so there was a player for the Kansas City Chiefs who had, I believe, killed his wife and then killed himself outside their facility. This was a bunch of years back. And everybody in the football world was shocked. Everybody was horrified. And Costas uh, had a little bit of time on halftime where they basically let him say whatever he wanted to say. And it's interesting, like a week later, he'd said he'd mishandled it. Mm. He wanted to talk about gun culture and professional athletes. And a lot of us interpreted it as being cheerleading for gun control and demonizing gun owners and the Second Amendment and things like that. Whether or not that's how he intended it, he himself recognized that he had come across as if he was oversimplifying a very complicated issue. Because in the case of this football player, this question of uh, are they getting the mental health they need? Is there concussions a factor? Um, and, and I think a lot of us would also observe young men who are successful in professional sports are generally making a heck of a lot of money. They don't have a lot of people around them who will tell them, no, that's a bad idea. Hmm. And maybe once you add firearms to the mix, you know what, maybe you do have a circumstance in which you're more likely to have something tragic occur. I don't think that necessarily means we'd all back a gun control proposal, but I think that, you know, maybe, okay, maybe we can have that kind of conversation. Great irony, uh, the the column he was responding to was by Jason Whitlock, who I believe is now sports at Fox Sports and who's generally considered a lot of conservatives' favorite sports columnists. You it's, know, fu- it was, it's funny, Jim, yeah. he actually was at Fox Sports and then he came over and now he's at Blaze TV. He actually works there we, here. Oh, okay, so yes, there we go, yes. Which yes. is, uh, it's mind boggling that like, I remember that, uh, that commentary and thinking this guy is the biggest anti-gun nut in the world. It really came off to me that way. And I freely admit it. Uh, and now like, I mean, quoting Jason Whitlock is like, now you get thrown out of the media for doing that in a positive way because he's too far right. Yeah, I, I, the great irony is that Costas was to the right of Jason Whitlock back in this controversy all the way, all the way back then. Amazing. But anyway, um, one of the things that Greg and I had decided to do was that, um, again, as I mentioned, this is the first time we'd had an interview on the show. And we decided, our usual show is about 20 minutes. I think this one goes like 35, 37 minutes or something. And we would give Costas, we would not interrupt him. We would knock him off. We'd say, you know, you take the whole three minutes or however much time you think is necessary to lay out how you see on this. And I think he enjoyed it. And I think our listeners really enjoyed it. And a lot of people had that similar kind of response to of, OK, I don't agree with everything he says, but mm-hmm. now I feel like I know where he's coming from. And he's not crazy. He's not unreasonable. I can see why he feels the way he does 
on these issues. And, you know, that's great. I think Greg and I decided we're going to do it. We're not turning over the format and becoming an interview show all the time. But right. if we can do more interviews like this, we will do so. And maybe it's good to have that gist of somebody who isn't seen as being on the right, but who may agree with this. Because, again, you know, Bob Costas is now a he, he's, he does not mince any words when it comes to uh, not just the Chinese government and the International Olympics Committee. He ripped into uh, LeBron James. He ripped into Colin Kaepernick for being very critical about where they see as failures in which America has not lived up to his values. And we can have that conversation. And being dead silent, no pun intended, although perhaps it's appropriate, uh, about the human rights abuses in China. And that's been a, you know, a lot of folks on the right have noticed that and thought, oh, these guys are hypocrites and all that kind of stuff. Man, Costas ripped into uh, LeBron James for criticizing Daryl Morey and, and other stances like that. So it was a great edit. So people who may have gone into this interview thinking they don't like Bob Costas and they don't agree with him probably were pleasantly surprised and said, oh, wait a minute. OK, I agree with that. That's pretty reasonable. Yeah, it's interesting because it, it's not coming from a guy who's trying to win votes. It's, you know, it's a guy who's already a legend. I mean, you could maybe argue that he's looking at his legacy and, and wanting to, you know, make sure people understand what kind of a person he was. Um, as I listened to it, though, I thought to myself, you know, as I kind of came around to the idea that maybe I did misjudge these things back in the day, uh, you know, you guys said you were critical of him as well. What do you take? What do you learn from uh, from this when you go back and you look at how you talked about mm -hmm. it initially uh, and then you wind up talking to the guy and, and kind of get a different perspective? Well, one anecdote he mentioned that I went back and checked and I linked to um, and I, I maybe it's even worth exploring, exploring a bit more. In the 1996 opening ceremonies in Atlanta, uh, the Summer Games, he mentioned the human rights record of China during the opening ceremonies as the Chinese team was marching in, uh, talked a bit about economic power and the access to their market that was very important, but also said that they had a human rights record that was deeply troubling and would create complete, you know, and this caused a firestorm in China. Now, I, you know, in 1996, I am still in college in those years. Yeah, of course. And uh, yeah. I actually had a chance to go to the Atlanta Games. And also, I, I missed this entire controversy. But apparently NBC at the, at the time issued a statement, wasn't fully with track. He, he, did, he issued no statement. He said he had nothing to apologize for. NBC basically issued a statement. It was kind of in the, well, we're sorry if you were offended uh, type comment. You know, kind of the, we, our, our, not, our intention was not to offend mm -hmm. anyone with that or anything like that. You might have seen a little bit of kowtowing to the Chinese government. Uh, but it's an interesting preview of a lot of these issues we see today. And, and the irony is that Bob Costas has already run into the wrath of the Chinese government back in 1996 for comments he said during the Olympics. And he pointed out he'd been critical of the Saudi team and how for a long time they did not have um, uh, any female uh, athletes participating. Uh, criticized the Iranian team for saying that they didn't refuse to compete against an Israeli athlete. There are a bunch of stances that Bob Costas has had over the years regarding Olympic athletes and how it intersect with geopolitics that I, I don't even know if you characterize them as necessarily left of center or right of center. Uh, I think you know, he's been appropriately critical of uh, some of the you know worst regimes on the planet. And probably folks like me have not given him enough credit for that over these, in part because we don't remember. 1996 was a long time ago. Mm. But if he's saying, hey, you know, it, it, a lot of the conversation was about how you don't want to be judged for one or two things you say over the course of a career. And I think it's a fair objection. And I think if you look at the totality of Costa's career, um, there's still stuff to disagree with if you want, but I don't think he can be characterized as some crazy far lefty. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned the Bill Maher comparison that he made during the interview. Mm. Uh, you know, when I think about Bill Maher, I don't think of a guy who's moved that much, right? Mm. The fact that he's being embraced by the right, and Costas, I think, is I felt the same way about here. Is that because like the Overton window has shifted that much that there's that, that maybe the left is is so much farther left than what, what we were used to 10 or 15 years ago that now people who used to kind of seem like they were out there a little bit now are kind of in this group of all of us that are looking over there and saying, wait, that's pretty weird. Yeah. So I think this is a topic I've been doing a lot of thinking about lately, and I am really glad to see not just the Bill Mars, but the Andrew Sullivans, the Vary Weisses, pardon me, I'm going to brace myself, even the Matt Iglesiases, <laughs> uh, people who I have not been fond of for a very, very long time who find themselves at odds with the uh, woke left and who start saying, hey, guys, we've gone too far. And I think we on the right should welcome them as allies of convenience and recognize this is a temporary alliance. 
the day is going to come when Bill Maher is going to piss us off all over again. Yeah. He, he has not changed. You're right. I don't think he has. I don't think he's shifted to the right. I think the perception of what is expected of him as a comedian uh, or what is expected of him as an entertainer has changed very dramatically. And I think he's, you know, there's irreverence to, you know, at the, at the, at the heart of all kinds of comedians. I think Dave Chappelle fits in this category. And you end up with a situation where to so many folks on the woke left, there's a very narrow range of what you're allowed to be making fun of. Hmm. Generally things on the right, you know, uh, Republicans, Christianity, white people, uh, traditional values, families, dumb dads on sitcoms, you know, like there's a very narrow range of people who are acceptable targets of mockery. So if you dare, you know, uh, heaven forbid you tell a joke about a trans person, well, now you've committed some sort of, you know, hate crime and it's it's the end of the world or something. So I think a lot of these are people whose uh, Costas is a little bit different, but I think in the comedians, their brand is irreverence. Their brand is that nothing is sacred. And to the woke left, a whole bunch of things are absolutely sacred and cannot be uh, cannot be mocked at all. The unfortunate irony is that everything they find sacred is the exact opposite of everything that we find sacred. Right. You know, church, family, God, America, mm -hmm. all that good stuff. All that, all that good stuff. Uh, Jim Garrity, a senior political correspondent uh, for National Review, co-host of the Three Martini podcast, also uh, on the Editor's Podcast as well. And before I go, I, I want to make sure that the audience is aware, if, if you don't know, so much of what you probably now take as a common knowledge about the lab leak theory in China oh. uh, comes from Jim Garrity and his hard work from the very beginning of this. Uh, so if you are not reading Jim's stuff uh, all the time, please make sure you do. Jim, your work on that was absolutely incredible. Stu, uh, Stu, thank you for those kind words. I will be diving back into this topic again. And, you know, uh, so far, there have been no assassination assassination attempts by the Chinese government. Oh, God. Oh, God. Here they come. Okay. Whoa. All right. That well, was close. But other than that, I'm fine. So, anyway. well, but, but thanks for remembering and thanks for calling attention. Uh, yeah, I do really appreciate it. Make sure you follow Jim on, uh, on Twitter and get his stuff at National Review as well as the podcast. Jim, thanks so much for coming on the program. Always enjoy it, Stu. Take care. So Chris Wallace is leaving Fox News. Uh, here's, here's the description of Chris Wallace uh, from mainstream media publication. Fox News anchor Chris Wallace, one of the few high-profile news personalities who retained a reputation of integrity as Fox leaned hard into right-wing and conspiratorial programming, announced Sunday that he is departing Fox News and joining CNN+. Plus. The description, of course, from CNN. That's how they describe it. Chris Wallace. So I don't, I don't know if you could take anything from that, but I think it's kind of interesting. Janice Dean has spoken out now about the uh, big Cuomo thing. We had her on radio today. If you want to go back and listen to that, uh, the radio podcast always available to you. Uh, she was on to talk about how Chris Cuomo um, was calling her all sorts of really nasty names uh, and uh, saying terrible things about her and, and trying to dig up dirt on her to paint her as a right-wing extremist as she was uh, became critical of Chris Cuomo's brother. Of course, Chris Cuomo is now out of a job, as is Chris Cuomo's brother. Good things for America. Now, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. It does not seem like they're putting Chris Wallace into Chris Cuomo's uh, time slot. He's going to the Internet, uh, CNN Plus. Uh, however, uh, that slot is not yet filled over at uh, CNN. But you can check out that interview from Janice Dean uh, on the radio program. I think you'll probably enjoy it. And I will say this. Um, I, uh, the, the person of the year came out today. Now, Times person of the year was finally announced. Um, I do not care <laughs> about who Times person of the year is. They are a magazine. Uh, at least they were. I don't even know if they still are a magazine. They come up with a name that they think will get the most clicks. That person this year, Elon Musk. Elon Musk is the person of the year. Congrats to Elon, who has got to be thrilled by this. You know, the, this guy who's like innovating all over the place. Got to be thrilled to get this nomination of an award from a magazine. That's just got to be the honor of his life. I will say, I, you know, I heard some people saying that, you know, uh, they you know, gave all sorts of different um, ideas of who this should be. Because it's, I guess it's just fun to speculate. People like lists. People like awards. People like, you know, the, the top, you know, what does it matter who the top 75 NBA players are of all time? People still like talking about it on sports radio when they get announced, right? Like, it's just something that the media does to get people talking. And I don't think there's a real negative uh, to this. Uh, but like Elon Musk, I think, 
people were saying it was a terrible pick. I don't know. I think it's a decent pick. You know, Elon Musk is one of the few interesting people in our society, and we are critical of Elon Musk here somewhat often because of uh, his stance on, uh, I think he's a complete alarmist on climate change. The man is literally building spaceships to escape it. I think that's pretty, I mean, I like that he's building spaceships. I think it's pretty cool. Wouldn't be my motivation, but hey, he's the one with a billion dollars, not me. Okay. Uh, in fact, he's got tens of billions of dollars. Uh, you know, Tesla. The, I've told you about Tesla. They're, they are really great cars. I mean, they're incredibly fast and impressive, uh, and he has really, you know, changed the world as far as uh, as far as automobiles go um, with his company. That is now one of the most valuable companies in the world. And all this goes on while he's a huge advocate for climate change. You'd think this would be the type of person the left would want to embrace. Here's a person who can reach across the aisle and maybe convince some evil, bad right wing nut job who thinks the tornadoes in Kentucky weren't caused by climate change, that maybe this is a bigger problem than we think it should be. I mean, Elon Musk talks and a lot of people on the right listen right now. You'd think he'd be a valuable voice instead because he wanted to keep his 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 electric car company open during COVID. COVID, he's now evil because he he's saying he doesn't want any more subsidies for his company. He's now a bad guy. Uh, I don't understand how this world works anymore. But Elon Musk, person of the year. Elon Musk actually said he was going to sell all of his real estate, all of his homes. And I think he just sold his his last one. Uh, he, for some reason, decided he didn't want to own all this real estate all over the place. He wanted to get rid of that. He didn't want all that stuff. I don't know. Did he go to realestateagentsitrust.com beforehand? I mean, probably. Did he get a good price for it? Did he get the best price? Did he have the best agent in his area? You think a guy with billions of dollars uh, might have that person. But you know what? I will tell you, this little company, uh, realestateagentsitrust.com, was started by one Glenn Beck. And Glenn Beck might not be a billionaire, but he's got some cash and could get any real estate agent he'd want. People want to work with Glenn. They might find him really annoying and unhealthy, but they like his money. And so you'd think uh, people would come and, and he'd be able to get the best agent. Well, he started it because he couldn't find the best agent. There was no mechanism available to screen real estate agents in an effective manner. Now there is. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Elon, go there now. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Check it out. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Coming up on Friday is the big day. It's the last day of, I think it's the last show of our year, which is going to be fun. We're going to show you the Christmas twist, which is always a holiday blessing for all. Uh, but also, uh, it's Power Hour night. Uh, StuDoesPowerHour.com. StuDoesPowerHour.com. Go there now. You can uh, RSVP for uh, the event. And if you do so, you're going to be on a list of people that we're going to be picking some uh, big winners out uh, for prizes and some fun stuff I think you're really going to like. So go there. If you RSVP for the event, you'll get on that uh, group and you may very well win a prize from us here at Stu Does America. Um, also, they have links to all the other stuff, the merchandise for the event and, and, and all of that. If you've never seen one of these things, you're missing out because they're fantastic. Big group of us are going to be there. Chad Prather, my wife, Lisa Page, is going to be there. Uh, Half Asian lawyer, Bill Richmond, Jason Buttrell, Sarah Gonzalez. Uh, who else am I leaving? I don't know. It's a staff of thousands. And we're going to be there uh, one shot of beer per minute for an hour while attempting to talk politics. It starts in a coherent sort of way. And by the end, it's a mess. So join us. Make a mess of your own life as well with us on December 17th, 9 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, youtube.com slash stewdoesamerica, or check it out, stewdoespowerhour.com to get uh, all set up and RSVP'd for the event. Really got it. We didn't have time today. We got to get into the, what Gavin Newsom wants to do as a reaction to the abortion ruling on the Texas abortion law. Maybe we'll get into that tomorrow because it's just insane, but it shows where the left is right now. Uh, before we leave, uh, studosmerch.com is the place to go to get your merch for, you know, Christmas, you know, whatever. You might need to print out. A, I don't know if it's too late at this point, but you may need to print out a picture of it. Tell them it's being delivered late. Just say, I don't know, Jeffy probably screwed up the order. That's a totally acceptable excuse. Studosmerch.com. The code is Stu20. You can save 20% off all the stuff. There's Christmas stuff up there. There's this Joe Biden uh, journal that we just got. I mean, a senility now journal is something you just got to have, don't you?